How's it going? Welcome to Someone Who Isn't Me, episode number 18. Uh, This one is with Dan Searle, drummer of the band Architects. And this episode's a bit different from some of the others for a couple of reasons, but the most important one being is the fact that Dan actually got in contact with me asking if he could come on the podcast. And that was because he wanted to speak about his twin brother, Tom, the guitarist and songwriter in Architects who passed away because of cancer in August 2016. So we sat in his flat and we spoke for almost, I guess, almost two hours about Tom, about how Dan's been um, in the six months since his brother's passing. And we spoke about architects and we spoke about what the future holds for them. Normally, when I record an episode of Swim, I prepare notes which take on uh, some sort of semblance of questions and I just try and have a conversation with the guest. But I actually left those in my bag for this one because... I thought that this was very much a conversation that Dan should lead and it was a tough one to do um, and anyone that knows Dan or myself will appreciate that in amongst some very dark and heavy discussion there was like a lot of laughs and there's funny moments as well um, there's also one part where it almost feels like well I actually say where it feels like we're skirting around a particular subject which I suppose in hindsight was essentially what happens to consciousness if you will after leaving sort of material existence and I didn't want to press him with it to be honest so it was actually a conversation we had once we'd stopped recording so aside from that it was a very honest and candid conversation that I know is going to get transcribed and pulled apart for various news pieces and that's kind of the point on why Dan wanted to do it he said he didn't want to have to sit and have those kind of conversations in interviews with people that he doesn't really know so um So yeah, so feel free to pick this one apart if you write for any news outlets. However, please don't put shit out of context for clickbait as that is weak. And if you can make sure that you link back to the podcast on iTunes, people can search for someone who isn't me. Also on acast.com forward slash someone who isn't me. That way people can listen to the whole thing if they're interested. Architects have just started their North American tour. They're going to be playing at Reading and Leeds Festival in the UK this summer as well as a bunch of others like throughout Europe and whatnot during festival season. All dates can be found online on their Facebook page, which is facebook.com forward slash architects UK. Their album, All Our Gods Have Abandoned Us, the album that gets discussed in this episode, is not only crushing, but it's an incredible piece of work. So if you're not aware of that album already, you should go and check it out. This is Dan Sell. So it's interesting that you emailed me for a start because Mm -hmm. if I'm honest I would never have said to you come and do an episode of the podcast or come and do something on the radio yeah I mean I I understand why in my head I've reasoned why Mm -hmm. but um tell tell me a bit about that well yeah I I definitely wanted to make a point of that because uh I'm not Corey Taylor or Maynard James Keenan or Chino Marino or even Sam Carter for that matter and, <laughs> and and the fact that you've had Sam on the podcast already makes it look even perhaps even odder that that I am a guest on your on your show so I wanted to make the point that I asked to be on here um, because I don't want and I have a tendency to over, overthink things I don't want people to think that you asked me looking for some kind of story. Yeah. I didn't want people to think, oh, well, Dan's obviously... Okay, I'm going to have to say Dan Carter when mm. speaking in this term. Dan Carter has asked Dan Searle to be in a show because there's a big juicy story there with some yeah. some minor headlines that might interest people. Um, the fact of the matter is, it's been six months, just over six months since Tom died now. Um, and... I've had people ask me to speak to them, um, magazines specifically, um, and I didn't want to, I didn't feel like that was the right medium for me to sort of uh, go about speaking about this for the first time. Um, you know, the people at the magazines are well-intentioned. I don't think they're just doing it to get a juicy story. I think they want to support us after we've been through a difficult thing yeah. um, so there's no slight on them it's just that I wanted to speak freely about this subject mm. um, 
I didn't want it to be edited. Um, if it's in print media, I don't know what's going to be included and what's not out of a conversation. And even when something is, is written down, it can be taken out of context. You can, you can, and you can read things certain. Sure. Even if it's not out of context, you can still read things in a different manner. So, mm. yeah, I, I understand. Uh, so that was really important to me, yeah. <coughs> and uh, I, I... You knew Tom. Um, you had some awareness of what he was going through. Yeah. And... I felt that I know you well enough to know that I can speak to you um, about things that, in a way that you will uh, appreciate and understand, um, whereas I don't know if that will be the case if I speak to someone in a magazine or, or not, you know. Yeah. So this just felt like the right way to do it. I also felt like, oh, this is dropping... <laughs> Dropping like a a big uh, sort of a heavy thing on 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 your shoulders in a sense because it's you know it's not an easy conversation it's not I'm not promoting an album here you know yeah. I know that's not what what everyone speaks to you for but um, this sort of felt like a bit of a selfish thing for me like it might be cathartic in some way for me to 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 publicly speak about certain things you know yeah well I, I mean. I I really appreciate that you thought of me because I, I think it is all those things and I and I do it's the only one of these that I've done so far where where I actually had to think about it in the sense that did was it something like I I I didn't want and I would never have turned around and said no let's not do that obviously mm. because because we're friends and and obviously I understand the reason you're doing it but at the same time it is there's a lot to it and I did think that a lot of people would be like well this guy's a dick why the hell is he asking him all well, the, I, I, about this sort of stuff and 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 then I was like well whatever it doesn't really matter because sure. once I think you know once people get to hear it then they'll realize that I've not phoned you up in a I don't know I, I want to say not ghoulish but because that that sounds I don't mean it to sound like that but do you know what I mean Mm, I do know what you mean, and I had thought about it, and I, yeah. I had, I had definitely, uh, you know, I, I had wanted to make sure that people didn't read into it the wrong way, yeah, you know, because it might seem random. Oh, Dan sells on Dan's show. Why would he? No, I, I don't think that anyone would view it from that way because there's obviously a lot to talk about, and there's, um, mm. and and people do want to know, and I don't think that's because they're using that word again I don't I, it's the wrong word to use because it, it's uh, I don't mean it to sound disrespectful but people obviously want to know yeah and and, and and a lot of people a lot of people don't know um, the full I want to say story I suppose hmm. um, and even there was a even when Tom was alive, it was a small group of people who really knew what was going on, um, yeah. and it it very rarely um, extended beyond the band and family, really. Mm. Um, but obviously, you know, Tom spoke to you when we did the, when we did Made of Ale, the Made of Ale session, um, and I spoke to you um, at the Crang Awards. Yeah to let you know that um, that it had come back and, and that Tom was going to have surgery the following day. And you were at the wake. Yeah. And when I spoke at the wake, I wanted to make sure that people um, got a sense of, of how Tom was. Yeah. Um, I thought that was incredible. Your eulogy at the wake was amazing Thank it you. really was because to have to do those terrible things for a for a family member is is a tough thing to do mm -hmm. to, to have to do it for y your twin brother is I can't even imagine but then to do it in the manner that you did where it, it just came across like it was <laughs> it was like the darkest darkest stand-up I've <laughs> ever witnessed yeah. and it was and that was, it was fantastic, which sounds mm. like a terrible thing to say. I don't, but it, it really was yeah. uh, on every level. And yeah. I, and, and I thought, <laughs> I thought you got across a lot of, 
really beautiful things but did it in such a way that just when it felt like everybody was going to implode <laughs> with grief you know i found i felt like a <laughs> everyone was coming up to me after i spoke and saying how funny it was um it was easy to be funny hmm. because the tension of the occasion was so high there was so and there's so much there's so much emotion at a moment like that so that when you when you break the ice with something a little bit outrageous or something yeah. silly or whatever it is people are just they laugh extra because they're it's almost like a relief you yeah. know that that everyone is allowed to laugh you know that this yeah. doesn't have to be um the the sort of bleak occasion that it could be um so i tr yeah. i wanted to and and you know what? i wanted that that's a reflection of tom yeah and, 100%. and and some of the stuff that people found hilarious was just me repeating stuff tom had said mm. you know um and that you know and i and I, I want to touch on that a bit because obviously tom has some uh public status um and people you know cared about him people that tom didn't know and of course you hear a story about um someone who's 28 dying of cancer and it's it's a, it's a very sad story and it resonated with people um and I think it's important for people to know, and this is what I wanted to make clear at the wake to some, to some degree, was that it wasn't all totally bleak. Um, that Tom was good humoured. Yeah. And, you know, like, I, I've touched a little bit with what I've said online, but me and Tom had, like, some great times when he was sick. Well, from my perspective, when, when I had that conversation with him at Maida Vale... He was, r again, really funny. Mm. And he was saying things that I was laughing at because, A, they were funny, but also I was laughing because his approach to it and his attitude and the way he seemed to be dealing with everything was amazing. And, it, <laughs> and it, um, it, yeah, it, it was blowing my mind that people can can view things in that way. With that kind of adversity. Yeah. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it. I, I think I. I think I repeated some of these things when at, at, at the wake. He. <laughs> when he first got to the hospice, he told them, me and him were both joking with the, with the nurses, and Tom was saying, that he his wishes were to be, slaughtered halal style and be hung upside down and have his throat slit and then he said he wanted to be fed to pigs at his funeral <laughs> and at one point he was he was getting taken care of uh, by the by the nurses this is probably 10 days before he died and uh, he asked the nurses to pass him pass he asked for his phone because he said he needed a new Tinder profile picture <laughs> He was never on Tinder, but he's just, he's just, that's, you know, he, he was still just fucking around and joking around, um, even in a very, very difficult situation. Yeah. But then it's an amazing coping mechanism, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. But w w what you just touched on a moment ago <clears throat> about when, when we saw you at a Maid of Ale, um, and, you know, Tom was saying, you know, he was sort of telling you about, where it was in his body at that point mm. and saying you know but I'll be okay yeah a lot of people read the lyrics you know to Gone With The Wind Pimento Mori and um, think you know that he'd given up he'd almost. given up yeah no I didn't I didn't get that at all which is why I was it was it was such a shock yeah because um, that conversation, I mean, I know that you you, would, you did the session and you were planning to go out and do the Bring Me Tour in Australia, mm. right? And, and you were trying, you were like, the only way we can do it is if it actually lined up with something that you guys were doing. Yeah. 
and it turned out that that was actually that event was happening in Australia so it felt like there was a real optimistic it was <laughs> and this is the thing this is this is what no one really under, understands that didn't know him is that there was so much talk of the future yeah um and you know i i people i even i look back at those lyrics now and think oh what this now i read them i go what had tom given up <laughs> you know because but the thing is with any lyrics it's a snapshot hmm. you know yeah. it's a snapshot of a moment and tom wrote some of those lyrics right after his cancer came back hmm. um which is around um may 2000 15 and it hit him you know but he was also like <laughs> so we went to South America we did slam dunk he had found a lump in his leg yeah and then we went he had to have tests and we were going to South America it was gonna we couldn't afford to cancel so he stayed at home and we did it as a four piece and then he called me when we were in Buenos Aires and he said oh it's cancer it's come back so I got on a plane come straight straight back home and uh, to make to hit, to try and get to his appointment with the doctors, you know, so I could be there. Yeah. And I was like, obviously upset and worried. But but when I got back to the UK and I got to uh, I you know I got back to my flat and then I went up to my mum's and Tom was there and we went up to the doctors and Tom was fine. Yeah. <laughs> like joking around it's been and straight away I was like oh well that relieved me to a degree but I I had spent you know it's a long journey home from Buenos Aires on your own and you'd just been playing it through in your mind yeah and then I got home and Tom was just like pissing around (laughs) yeah (laughs) so I was like right okay I understand um and yeah he missed he missed some shows but during that period that summer yeah he had some moments where he was worried understandably of course and he wrote lyrics about it Mm. um and we wrote the album that summer most of it um just me and tom like in his bedroom just right um you know and and it was the the best creative experience that we ever had yeah it's i mean it's that was the thing like when the record first came out and when i first got it and then Mm. and i was you know kind of going through it all and it's so intense and 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 it does feel at moments that it is really bleak. Yeah. But but I always found that there was the... It was tempered with a positive energy. Yeah. That's how I felt anyway. It, it, and and the, everyone <coughs> uh, gravitated towards this word bleak hmm. when it came to describing it. Well, album. of course, yeah. And it's a funny thing because when me and Tom were working on those songs especially it was around July and August 2015 it was like Tom was very happy yeah um honestly probably the happiest he would ever be well it's it's funny isn't it in the sense that I think you can make great art that can that can be the where you can pour everything into Mm -hmm. it and actually feel this sounds a little hippie but quite cleansed by it but it is a cathartic you get thing as hippie but, as you want with me yeah then. great awesome because um maybe that was that was the way that um all of that negativity was being taken out yeah know? well and, uh, yeah and, and that thought has crossed my mind for sure for me it was it was easier than for tom of course um uh, and at that point it was it, things were very hopeful yeah how was it for you though like working on those songs especially like seeing the lyrics and stuff did but it must have been c- quite jarring to see that he was the most creative and happiest he's ever been <laughs> yeah, but with his dark lyrics yeah sure and it was only really those two sets those two songs that really hit me the the other the other songs are more a bleak world of you yeah um but it was momentum or gone with the wind that, and and you know i heard gone with the wind um, in September and I was in Barcelona we had finished writing it but here then he had, they had sent, him and Sam had, had worked on the, the vocals and they had sent me the chorus and you know the, the lyrics are 
a sickness with no remedy except yeah. the one inside of me. Um, but that was just reflective of Tom's philosophy on the disease um, yeah. because he felt like, you know, medicine struggles with cancer. Yeah. And he felt like, well, the answer is, is inside of me because people do get better. Yeah. Um, and me, oh, I became very... Uh, all I read about was cancer yeah for about a year and a half um and were you I'm assuming that he was as well but were you no he wasn't no well that's interesting so then so were then you were you that I was guy that was finding doctor. everything and I then was, going have you, have you thought about this have you yeah. thought about this yeah exactly so to protect him I, I suppose you know of course um So yeah, I mean, I'm going off on tangents all over the place, but no, that's fine. That that was, yeah. I spent a lot of my time, all my time, writing, reading, thinking mm. about, talking about cancer. Unless I was with him, and then I would just give, tell Tom, you know, oh, well, I've heard this helps. But I became very interested in this concept of, you know, spontaneous remission. Yeah, and SIBO effect, all these kind of well, things. Well, that's the thing because when he was telling me in Made Vale about the the Joe Dispenza thing, mm. and and um, anyone that doesn't know his work. The placebo is you is is the best place to start. Like I guess with his book, where where he's saying, yeah, you are the placebo. Oh, you are the placebo. Yeah. My yeah. my apologies. Yeah. And then um yeah, because it, on on first glance, a lot of people would be very dismissive about it, mm. but it is actually hard science that he's worked into, mm. and, and I think that the idea that that a person, I mean, it's you know the physical matter of a person, mm. shall we say, because mm -hmm. there is a that's not a whole of a person in my opinion anyway the um you know you are a a, um, a, a bag of chemicals sure. and and the, and you are manufacturing chemicals constantly yeah. some of which have truly miserable adverse effects yeah. and some of which can counteract those and yeah. have very positive effects and i know that that was something that that you yeah. were both really looking into yeah we went we went away to like a one of his meditation retreats in italy in i want to say april and the doctor told tom not to go because they thought it was a bad idea in case things got worse but he went anyway and hmm. and it really helped him and we had an incredible weekend together helped in in what way in with his mindset with his physicality with or his mi yeah with his mindset i mean me and tom tom was meditating two three four hours a day and i would often wow. meditate two hours with him together yeah and how was that as an experience uh yeah profound and important in just helping us get through it hmm. but it it that all those lessons we learn in terms of the importance of your mind hmm. um it was it was it, i think it was invaluable for both of us yeah yeah I think so because I think it, I was going to say it, it gives you a grounding but it's it's not it's almost the total opposite of that it's a reminder that you know <laughs> we are not our bodies um, yeah. and yeah we are just a bag of chemicals and you Meat know and water we identify with our thoughts and our behaviors and our beliefs mm. but they're just conditioned responses conditioned neurological pathways in our brains that we call daniel p carter and yeah. let's say daniel j cell because i think the middle name um and it, it it we had like really joyful moments together from that yeah and you know like that's I learned a lot then that's helped me now as well you know like I still meditate every day only the last couple of months I've yeah. been able to again but it helped it's um why why did why couldn't you in that period would <laughs> surely that would be the time when it would be the most yeah beneficial you would, absolutely you would, you would think so um <laughs> was it just too much too much yeah. of a reminder of what it of mm. when you when you first started doing it 
it opened up like you have to but just bear with me because I'm yeah. it's actually a bit harder than I thought it would be. Okay. Um, no, that's but, fine, man. I didn't ever think it wasn't going <laughs> to be anything other than that. That's why I was wary. Yeah. If you want to take a minute. No, 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 it's, it's fine. Um, <laughs> oh, should I pause it? No, it's okay. It's, it's fine. When when Tom first died, I think when you lose anyone like that in your life, you kind of just go into shutdown a bit. Yeah. And um, I felt bad, you know, and um, emotional. But usually I just smoked weed or drank alcohol. Yeah. And I was not abusive. I'm. I'm no like. I'm not a destructive guy. I would hit a vaporizer a couple of times. I'm very practical. You yeah. know. I don't like go off the rails. I'm just, just not who I am. Mm. Um, and so it. I kind of just swept everything under the rug, and, to a degree. And when it got to a point, you would dial it down. Yeah. With those. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's that's a very understandable thing to do. For whatever reason, meditation just opened up the well of grief yeah but do you think that that's very specifically doing that for a reason absolutely and it took about the end of December last year so just a few months a couple months ago hmm. I just hit a wall with it um, and got started getting anxious and it was just, you know, a wake up call. Like, I can't just hide it. Yeah. Um, but I think the way that you've all dealt with this is, has been very, it's been as open as, as anyone would expect. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't think anyone's going, when's this next Facebook post <laughs> going to happen that, that tells me everything that I want to, do you know what I'm sure. saying? Yeah. I think, and I, yeah. I, I, I think that's a, such a beautiful thing to have witnessed that everyone around the band, be it other bands, your friends, um, and the music community at large and fans, has been so incredible, it seems. And that's only really hitting me in the last couple of months. Um, because yeah, I, 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 I have I stopped drinking, stopped smoking, uh, weed, um, not cigarettes. I, don't smoke cigarettes at all <laughs> for the record yeah. Yeah. I'm still smoking loads of cigarettes but no I don't <laughs> smoke cigarettes at all um, and I just kind of realised I just had to deal with it yeah. um, and it, that inv and it's in our culture you know grief or no grief people don't like to just be you know we take our phones to the toilets yeah you know what I mean like um yeah, being alone with your thoughts can be a really tough time for... People are terrified of it. Yeah. You know, um, at the best of times. Yeah. You know, it's like they don't want to be alone. And if they are alone, they've got to be watching TV or looking at Instagram or Twitter or whatever. Mm. Um, and failing those, and there's always alcohol or whatever. Yeah. Whatever your vice is. Um, so it just got to the point where I thought, well, you know, I've, I've got to... Um, I've just got to deal with it head on and uh did was there a discussion with anyone about it or did you just my girlfriend yeah yeah um and what was that what did she did she agree yeah she always knows what's best for me and they i always do and i don't realize it at the time yeah usually and usually i get mad at her if she tells me mm. something i don't like but then like a month two three four months later i go yeah, I remember right. when he said that to me. Mm. Yeah, you you were right actually, and that's happened over and over again. Yeah. Um. So uh, I apologise to her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. But yeah, so I I just I you know it, it's not been easy for her for to um be in this situation. But then you should never beat yourself up over that. No, of course no, and and I don't, and and she asked me not to, you know. Um, yeah. But. 
you know, she always keeps an eye on me at the, at the best of times, but after Tom died, she said, do what you need to do. Mm. Um, which was sort of the green light for me to be like, you know, I like smoking weed. Yeah. Um, and, and I was actually talking about this. I can't remember who with. But a few days after Tom died, we went to his flat because um, Adam, our guitarist, mm. uh, li- was lived there part time. He lives in Vancouver normally, but when he's over, he he lives he lived at Tom's because he had a spare room. And we all went over there because we knew we were gonna have to move his stuff out soon, and we we're just sort of you know, well let's go to Tom's and be together and whatever. And I had a bottle of red wine and some good weed and a vaporizer and just you know got stuck in and it, it, it made me go from like despondent to jovial to fine good you know yeah. it didn't just numb me I had a great time you know yeah and our sound guy Johnny was in Brian doing some work for us um, prepping some stuff for the future or whatever and he came over and he I just was looking back yesterday I think thinking he what must he have thought of me because I was just like joking and pissing around um, but then I, as I said no one's going to ever judge anyone for dealing with their own sure. life in, in that way sure it just I just think it must have been a, a, a jarring yeah. uh, thing to witness hmm. uh, against what he had perhaps expected you know yeah, um, yeah I, did, I, I did a very similar thing when when a friend of mine passed away and um, he was actually the 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 guy that managed our band, and we all went mm-hmm. went over to his flat and went through it, and it and it was exactly that. And afterwards, we all kind of looked at each other and were like, "I'm I'm glad it was just us here." Mm. Yeah. But but then I I also think well that's 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 perfect. Yeah. That's how it should be. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think I don't think anyone that moves on wants to at any point look back and go look at those maudlin people about how they're acting yeah, but then yeah. that might that's a that's a whole other conversation about the wider scheme of things and what happens and mm-hmm. what you know yeah yeah absolutely but um but yeah i don't think you should ever beat yourself up over no, the fact I, that, I, that, that and you... i don't it's just um uh, it's i've sort of um the whole way through the last 6 months um, tried to sort of figure out grief, you yeah. know, and it's it's such a strange, you know, there's because of the complexities of personalities and every person being so infinitely different in so many intricate ways. Yeah, finding a way that is appropriate, the best way to deal with it is 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 there's no one really knows, yeah. you know. Yeah. how do you? mitigate the pain of grief effectively and I'm the kind of person that just wants to intellectualise everything and then fast track it just let me fast track it you're like I want to do everything I want to hack everything the best way I can mm. you know that's all so you know <laughs> I started playing guitar I want to I want to learn guitar as quickly as I possibly can well news just in Dan you can't I'm not going to be Vi overnight yeah. and you know dealing with anxiety well what's the best how do I deal with this quickly and get it over and done with grief how do I get you know if yeah. I if, will I get over Tom dying if I just think about the worst memories over and over again and get it all out and cry as much as I can and well no that doesn't work either because you I tried that and you just it just makes you feel really really awful what you thought that that was actually going to be the way <laughs> to kind of just like track. someone told me like uh, some family friends told me um <laughs> Their mo- a friend of mine, his mother died when I was a teenager hmm. and he's a close friend of uh, my mum's. And I saw them a few days after Tom died and they were just sort of, you know, in a sort of quite c- cynical English way saying, oh, you've got to cry for 100 hours, you know. And of course I didn't take that literally. Hmm. But I, I think some part of me thought, right, okay, there is a, there's a certain amount in me. Go. Can I just yeah. squeeze it all out as quickly as possible and get that? get it over and done with because this is exhausting and tiring and I just want to like you know can, if I can just sprint the rest of the marathon instead of walking it then great and then I can relax the rest of the day sort of thing you know yeah. but that's just that is the way I tend to be 
with everything, you know. Mm. I go exercise until I get injured and then I have to stop. That's the, and I, I, it's part of my personality that I recognize that I need to learn to pace myself. Um, but then at least you did do that with, with the meditation, but maybe then that's... That I think that that is... Yeah, I, I see why that would have been so hard. But I also see that it would be be truly beneficial. Well, the last few months meditation has just been so important, so invaluable to me. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's a bit like riding a bike, you know, and I did an intensive course essentially when Tom was ill because we yeah. just... Was that the first time that you'd approached it doing it? No, as well? I, I'd meditated in the past, but it was the first time where I'd meditated where I would do like an, an hour meditation. Yeah. And, and also, if you're doing um, leg meditations and also joint meditations mm -hmm. and group meditations, then that is a different thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. From just trying to sit in a room and switch your thoughts off. For yeah, minutes. yeah, there's so many different types of, uh, uh, of practice and. Um, and we explored a, few, a number of different types actually, and uh, but now I, I just it's so useful for me to just sit down. I don't do hour meditations now, but I will, I will do one or two twenty five minute meditations every day, and yeah. you know it's the it's without sounding like I'm saying it in a really like uh, escapist um, a negative way. It's like you know one of my the the nicest bits of my day, and I think to most people that sounds quite I don't know sad or I don't think so scared yeah well, you're not a normal person <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know if people think oh god the best part of your day is just sat down doing nothing well you know, it sounds like you've got a pretty boring life or whatever that it, sounds fantastic on any way <laughs> on any level I think but, it, but it's yeah. just about being with yourself and you know feeling how you feel and, it, and accepting it, you know and obviously coming back to your breath and just bringing about awareness mm. And that awareness is, I think, is just so important in so many other areas of your life. Um, yeah. And, you know, we were texting before we started um, about you getting some filthy vegan food. And, yeah. and I said, I won't judge you. And, but and you that... did. <laughs> and, and some of it is still sat here. <laughs> but, I, you know, it, it, I'm, I'm absolutely not, I'm no angel, you know, mm. uh, but... I do try to my best to remember not to judge and I do these simple things like that throughout my day hmm. I, be aware of the way I'm behaving and not be myself if I, if I behave badly but understand that I've conditioned myself over 29 years to behave that way but yeah. bring awareness to it and change it if you don't like it and you know accept that you don't have to be who you think you are and I kind of always grew up thinking well this is who I am yeah you know and there were always part that everyone has bits about their personality they don't like and you know we're never going to be perfect and we're not and no one's aiming for perfection here mm. but recognizing that we're always in flux and evolving and we can always if we bring awareness to them change the things about ourselves that we don't necessarily like or the things that don't necessarily serve us which is probably better, yeah. better put do you think they'll and I really don't want you to think that I'm saying that this is that, but I'm curious if you ever think that you'll be able to turn this situation into a into a way that it's that it's been a no, I don't want to say beneficial, but no, actually, I know what you, you're saying. I know what you're you saying. know what I'm trying to say. I know exactly what you're saying. And good because so, a lot of people will probably be like, "How the fuck can you say that to somebody?" Exactly. And I've thought this a lot. The idea of transmuting an event like your twin brother's death. Yeah into something positive is to most people offensive yeah. and sick hmm. and you know it, uh, yeah and I don't, I don't mean it and, like that but, uh, but I mean uh, but, as, a, as a but there are but there are positives to learn from any situation no matter how dire and yeah. I think that the real tragedy is letting those lessons go hmm. because then what's the whole what's it all been for what was it worth <laughs> You know, do you know what I mean? I mean, like, that's that's the constant question anyway. But yeah, I get it. It's, yeah. it's, you know, it's that thing in life, win or learn. And losing Tom is, is a massive loss. But what can I learn from it? Yeah. And how can I 
take it and help it I don't know enhance my life in some way and bring about more joy in my life um I think that the the reality when it hits home that when somebody gets ill that you love very much it does make you appreciate what you have and I think that's what I was that's more of what I was trying to say as you said I didn't mean that to sound no it does it, like I was being I, a shit bag I you mean, know like it, the, the architects I mean it's I appreciate it so much more now hmm But it's it's, a, it's such a horrendous lesson, isn't it? In yeah. That sense. Yeah. Like, it, 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 why but, is it that humans always have to learn in a, in, a, in a state of sorrow and tragedy and trauma? But it's so it's so often the way. Yeah. But then then again, you could look at that that that's the coping mechanism. Maybe that's how we how we draw some solace in amongst misery. Is that well? I think with with the band to use that as an example. I think the reaction that you've had recently and you know it's been a long time coming anyway man like and you guys would have been the first to have said that mm. several years ago yeah because you know the band has worked so hard and has consistently made amazing music and and it's been growing constantly but it just feels like there's been such an outpouring of love mm. and like I said I've only been able to access that recently yeah because I just didn't care before. Well, of course. But now it's like I'm just constantly overwhelmed and and surprised and shocked mm. at at the, at the reach that the band has now, the level of popularity that it's achieved is just so. Yeah. And I don't I don't mean beyond. this to yeah I don't mean that to say like oh you'd have never have got like a, <laughs> <laughs> no, no but which you, is that, uh, anyone that doesn't know us is probably going to listen to this and be like wow but I mean in the sense that I will never forget when when you were doing the eulogy mm. and you said that, that <laughs> so dark where um, Tom said how are the tickets doing yeah 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 and he said drop the cancer bomb we'll sell out in the day or something like that yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely ridiculous absolutely ridiculous. you know and <laughs> it's funny because we wanted we wanted the band to be our career obviously yeah what musician doesn't yeah um and we scraped by for five albums some of which were really well received and some not so much. Um, and then, of course, Tom got cancer. It's so funny to term it's cancer. It was a mole on his leg. Mm. You know, I... OK, let, let, I'll draw out the story a little bit more. Yeah. He, he had a weird-looking mole on his leg, and it was obviously weird. I will say that. I mean, in retrospect you could tell something was it was bad but he I dropped him off at the dermatologist and then he called me and said oh they're cutting it off right now and I was like okay I'm coming up not worried I was like this is going to be funny yeah because I'm going to get to watch my twin brother have a mole cut out of his leg under local anesthetic and he's going to be cringing and squirming and I'm going to film it on my phone and the mm. doctors let me and if you go through all my all the way through my Instagram account right near the start there's a picture of Tom holding up a vial with a mole in it mm. because we thought it was funny yeah. because there's no way it was going to be bad. Um, but it was and obviously it hit us all and trauma or pain or suffering is so often the catalyst for great art. Yeah. Um, it's not a necessity, but... Not a necessity, you're right, because... There are great works. I always of think art that aren't. people always say tortured artists. You have to be able to be a tortured artist to yeah. to write great music. And then I I always think of Dave Grohl. Okay, obviously went through an enormous tragedy in his life and wrote great records subsequently. Yeah. But also, I'm not sure that Kurt Cobain's death was the catalyst behind Foo Fighters' fourth or fifth albums, which were still great. Yeah. And he was obviously comes across as an extremely jovial, happy, uh, content, and affable man, yeah. famously so. 
Um, but we wrote Lost Forever Lost Together. And, you know, it was a massive breakthrough for us. Uh, and it was such a joyful time because Tom's cancer was like, by the time it came out, it was ancient history already. You know, he did six months, every six months we went for an appointment and he got mm. checked out. But it was like, that, that is done, you know. And you look at the statistics, you know, some people die of this. Mm. But at this stage, the odds look pretty good for Tom. So, all good. And it was, that just felt like... Um, yeah, I mean, everything we had ever worked for was coming to fruition. Yeah. And uh, it was just, it felt like we sort of had everything. Um, and then, of course, the cancer came back, and that was then the catalyst for the second album. Um, and that's led us to where we are now. And, and you know, I think, obviously, Losing Tom has, has galvanised fans where they want to get behind us, which is a beautiful thing. Yeah. Um, but it's just, uh, you know, Tom... I don't want to say Tom didn't care about the success. All that stuff just sunk to the background. And by the time the album got released, we did two album release shows in Brighton and Tom was really ill, you know. Yeah. And um, we didn't care. Like, I remember telling Tom, oh, the album charted number eight in the German charts. And he was like, okay, whatever. I don't care. It's like, oh, I'm really ill. I don't give a shit yeah. about that. Um and then obviously we played in in <laughs> there's so much to talk about we so we did those album release shows and Tom was really not well um and we was that because of the treatment more than no the, no be honest. we didn't know at the time okay but and the jury's still out actually okay um we'll never know but he had back pain because it was it was affecting his back and um he had had back pain earlier in the year when we were on tour with parkway drive and we just thought oh, hopefully it's nothing then we shot music videos with it and he had to take it easy because it was really bothering him and we started doing those meditations that we were talking about earlier and his all his pain just went away um for about two months hmm. and then He's like, yeah, he had all. I mean, anyone who's been knows anyone who's been in that situation knows that the symptoms is just like a lottery. It's just it could be all sorts. Yeah. Um, but we we went to hospital after those album release shows, and they told him it was it was bad, and um, they wanted to keep him in, and he said, no, nah, I'm going on tour tomorrow. <laughs> Sorry, um. I don't care. Yeah. Um, and so we played Rock and Ring and Rock and Park, and it was crazy. Like, Tom had to have oxygen on the bus, and was. My girlfriend was on tour just to look after him, which, and she had bitten off more than she could chew because she. You know, when we had been on tour uh, in earlier in the year, Tom, we gave Tom specific foods and supplements, and yeah. it was a drag. So we said, oh, you know, to my girlfriend, Emily, well, you come on tour and do that for him and we'll pay you. So Tom doesn't have to worry about that stuff. So he can enjoy his time with everyone else like normal and that stuff is just done for him. But he was far more ill than we had anticipated. Um, and he just, like, Rock and Ring was the first show and it just seemed impossible that he would play. I, I walked into the toilet Dover when we were going over there, you know, and he just meditated all day, pretty much, probably four or five hours. And and hobbled up and had his guitar put on him and he walked on stage and he just stood there. But it was just like sheer determination, you know. And mm. we and there was a massive storm. Several loads, a bunch of people got struck by lightning and the stage times all got put back. And we played it about midnight and it was yeah one of the best shows we ever played. And then the last show we ever played was the next day. Last show he ever played was Rock Rock in Park and <laughs> he just seemed so. Ill, it just seemed like there was no way he was going to do it. And then I, I, I had been on the bus with him. I walked back to to the dressing room and told the guys, like, I don't, we're going to have to work out a way to do this for, as a four piece. Like, I had been working on trying to sort it out so we could have his guitars on tracks so we could make the show happen. And then, like, he just like walks into the dressing room, like, hey guys, what's up? <laughs> like, seemingly fine. Um, 
and played the show and was like sat after the show and I remember he was sat hanging with some of the guys from While She Sleeps like behind the stage and they went on The Wiser yeah you know and there was you know, the day before uh, at Rock and Ring some friends had been after him uh, other, in other bands that were playing we just said he had the flu you know just he didn't want the he didn't want the the attention all the all the fuss. Yeah, and we did a, a festival in Holland. We played as a four piece. He couldn't do it. It was too early in the day because he was really bad at, in 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 the mornings. We were playing around midday, and then we did a show in Hamburg with Killswitch Engage, and he just stayed in the hotel day, and we played as a four piece. And the next day we were playing in Luxembourg, um, and it was like forty minutes before we were due on stage. And Tom said to me, "Oh, I need to get I need some oxygen." And I said, "Well, you you know you." you the doctor's surgeries are closed we have to get you an ambulance he said come get me an ambulance whatever and uh, so they came and they took his his vital they gave him oxygen but they took his vital and they're like you've got to go to hospital like, this is crazy you, yeah. you, you, he would have died if he hadn't gone to hospital so we took him in and cancelled the show cancelled the tour that's not true actually we didn't cancel the tour we, we said oh, we'll get him treated and then we'll drive to Greenfield tomorrow and we'll play the festival and Tom, Tom was like <laughs> I, I, what, he he got taken into ICU and was having a blood transfusion because he had uh, he was anemic and uh, they had him on antibiotics and some steroids and he was like uh, so what's going on what's started going on with the tour and I was like well maybe we'll play maybe we'll cancel Greenfield and we'll do download hmm. and he was like oh, yeah okay yeah Seems crazy, but yeah, it was all crazy at the time. Like, what a yeah. ridiculous situation to be in. And then uh, eight in the morning, he called me, and he was not in a good way, and um, it got worse. And yeah, they had to put him into a coma. And they said to me, like, he's never. They didn't say he's never going to wake up. They said he might never wake up. Yeah. Uh, and if he does, it's, it could be a month um, or more. Um, and the oncologist back in the UK told my mum, like don't let them put him in a coma because he won't wake up um wow and uh he was already in a coma at that point uh and he was just sort of like you know it's so strange just being with someone in a coma because you can't communicate and there's just sort of numbers on the screen mm. and that's what you're going that's he can't ask you can't ask how are you you just look at the numbers you know so I was like I, I convinced some of the people that worked there that I was a doctor and I didn't purposely like trick them but I, I had gotten to the point where I had become so entrenched in cancer and yeah. the way the human body worked and reading vital signs on uh, on a screen that I just knew what I was talking about by that point yeah. and he, he it's just he was like the same for a few days and then the fourth day he looked like his blood oxygen was a lot better and they had sped because he was having a breathing tube they had in, in, they had changed his breathing to a more normal rate so slowed it down um, and his, his haemoglobin was getting better and then <laughs> like I had just imagined Tom waking up over and over for those five days and, I just, and I, we've they said they would let us know if they're going to wake mum. We just turned up one morning, walked in. And he was just like looking at us. <laughs> it's like hi. He was confused as fuck because he had been in a coma for five days. But he was just like, but he was he was just awake. And then, like a week later, we he we cancelled the air ambulance that they wanted him to get, and me and Tom got the train home. And <laughs> that is. A, a serious roller coaster to go through. Yeah. And um, so yeah. So when he was in, it was, so it was a medically induced coma. Yes. What did they say to him? Did, how was that approach? Like, did, like, did you? Did, you must have spoken with him about it. Yeah. Like, about what? why they were doing that. No, and and what what happened? Or yeah, I, I just. He, it, he he it was inflammation in his lungs yes essentially okay but i so i just find that it, i find the whole thing is is so mind blowing because i've only ever dealt with it in such a um kind of a distant fashion mm. i 
I mean, it was such a. I sort of lived all of it with Tom, you know. Mm. And like, it was such an obsession of mine to getting better. But it was like, it was. A, it meant that I couldn't really process anything at the time. Yeah, because all you're focusing on is Tom. It, I, it was like where, I, it's like I didn't exist. To to. This is where we need to yeah. get to. This is where we. Yeah. And oh, this has gotten worse. But here's why, and here's how it's going to be okay. Hmm. Was what I always had to do. Are you glad that you immersed yourself in in all that information, or <sighs> because it's one of those things, isn't it? It's like as soon as people are ill, they're like, the worst thing you can do is look look on the internet. Yeah, and I wanted to. Be, I wanted to protect Tom from it, but I, I, and so I saw all the bad information as well as good information. But I just thought I kind of had this attitude that I can achieve anything I want to as long as I put my mind to it. Yeah, and we, the jury's out on that when matters of life or death, especially when it's someone else's life. Yeah. Um, and that's no slight on Tom saying he could have done better and saved his own life because that's yeah. not how it works. No. Um, he was in an immensely difficult situation and one that I, I still can't understand. But yeah, I, I had an unhealthy obsession with it, for sure. Yeah. But then I think... I think it's understandable because that's you are going to look for everything and try and help in every way you can yeah I mean it just felt like the only option and, and you know I, I don't I, pr I probably could have done things slightly differently but I don't regret anything and I'm certainly I feel exempt of any kind of guilt of you know I could have done more yeah but I don't feel like that. I feel like I did everything I could. No, I agree. And I, I think that that is the most brutal part of it, aside from him being gone, is the fact that the guilt resides. And, and I don't think there is... It, it's such an unnecessary thing. Mm. And, and, mis, and I think it would be f truly misplaced, but... I. I've, I've, any, I've been exempt from, you. It, from guilt, fortunately. Good. But, but it came at a cost. It came at, like, total immersion in a very difficult experience. But mm. at least I've, I've not had to feel any feelings of guilt over it. So yeah. that has been a positive. Um, but, yeah, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, I hope I don't have to revisit any of that information. I, I wrote, like... 76 pages on cancer trying to piece together the puzzle as if, as if anyone else hadn't already done it you know mm. just desperation I suppose you know thinking well if I put it all together maybe I'll see something I missed but then you know, I think it's also an, a, a way of, of processing that and dealing with it and eventually maybe accepting some of the some of the outcomes mm. Well, and mm. here's the thing about it, that is, I don't think I, Tom, as we've said, was, you know, talking about beating it always, mm. even in the hospice. We were talking about the next album in the hospice. Yeah. Because his intention was to leave the hospice. He went to the hospice, not because he thought he was going to die, but because he had pain and it was easier than the hospital and nicer and he knew it was an option see that's something I didn't know because being quite um, outside of, of, of that entire world like my mum's had it twice mm. um, but but it never got to the point where she went into hospice and mm. I always assumed that that was Glad to hear it. yeah I always assumed that that was, you know, when I heard that he'd gone in, I instantly assumed that that meant. Yeah, no, we, that. Talk, it, Which, we were talking I, that's, about that's, that's, the, talk, I, the next I find tour. that quite hard to say to you. But. He was saying, oh, I might, well, I don't think, Tom was like, I don't think I'm going to be able to do this Australian tour. 
and there was a point when he was like oh and and that uk european tour might be difficult yeah and he was and that's when he said what well, the thing that it's even that it was even in discussion is mind blowing isn't it just yeah uh, stubbornness i guess but you know i i i only accepted that that he might die about f- four days before he died wow But yeah, I mean, he said at one point, like, oh, I don't think I'll be able to do that European tour and the UK tour, but I might be able to come to the Brixton show. Uh, uh, yeah, and he was like, yeah, I, that's what, that's me. He said that um, he would like Josh to play for us. Yeah, I, w- I was wondering how h- how you go about finding somebody to do that sure well because that's before adam joined we begged josh to join okay and that's no slight on adam it's just that josh lives in reading and adam lives in vancouver (laughs) it's just geography (laughs) it's just geography yeah and josh had been filling in for us after tim left and we loved him and we've known him for years like we played Ashford Downtown Diner supporting Silosis in 2006 or 7 hmm. you know uh, we stayed at Josh's parents house when we recorded Ruin and his girlfriend's student housing <laughs> like, yeah. we've known Josh for years and he's always been a good friend and he's obviously a freak show guitarist oh unreal uh, and yeah I mean Tom, when Tom said I don't think I, you know I, he said I, I won't be able to come to the I might be able to come to the Brixton show, but I'll only be able to enjoy it if Josh is playing. So I told Josh that, and he didn't have a fucking choice. <laughs> you yeah. know, like you tell him, I told him that it's like it's the biggest emotional blackmail ever. He couldn't say no. Yeah. Um, but I know that Josh feels um, honoured to take that spot, and he's been he's been brilliant, and, and and we knew he would be. It was just one of those things that is just is just meant to be, and and he's done it with so much grace in such a difficult situation because yeah. it's not easy you know like no of course not because playing guitar aside yeah the, the technicality of that is 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 one thing and, and yeah. that's that's a big ask anyway yeah but um but i think it's all the other stuff which which can only be done by somebody that 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 knows everybody and knows the situation. Sure. And Josh, you know, Josh visits, visits Tom in the hospice and Josh was at Tom's funeral. Like, he's very, like, already close to us and mm. it was, there's just no one else it could have been. So we've, and I've told Josh this, we've, it's, it's just been a blessing that, he, that we've been able to have him with us because I just don't know what the on earth we would have done you know had we not had him as an option because i don't know where we would have looked you know but yeah it was just seamless and easy with him and you know you, someone might imagine me sort of looking at whoever fills tom's shoes with some kind of bitterness or something i don't know like some kind there might be something odd about it or i might feel uneasy about whoever takes that spot but mm. josh is just great you know yeah um so I, i'm really happy about that and I know that was what Tom wanted, so that's also good to know, you know. Yeah. Because here's the other thing. Because Tom didn't talk about dying, um, there was no sort of handover, really, and there was no real, like, if I die, do this. Um, you know, there. W- Tom didn't sort of express any architect's life after Tom sort of plan or what he wanted but because he didn't even see that that was actually he would a possibility. Be, occasionally he would be like oh, I've been thinking stupid stuff like who's going to use my gear if I die but then <laughs> <It's more laughs> worried about the gear yeah. but <laughs> so yeah. we but because Tom wasn't talking about dying and wasn't planning on dying. You know, we talked about the next album loads. Yeah. We talked about what it was going to be like, what we, what direction we wanted to go in. Um and 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 do you, uh, have you had those conversations since? Because that's obviously Sure, we've written songs. You have. Yeah. 
And I... With Josh? Uh, yeah. Yeah. How's that? A whole new experience. And, you know, it's... Uh, it must be very tough. <sighs> yes and no. You know, I wrote, me and Tom finished a couple songs. Okay. Ages ago. <laughs> you know, like... Because once Tom really got... Tom was sick for three months. He had mm. cancer for three years, but he was sick for three months. So after we finished All Our Gods, yeah, we wrote a couple of songs and they're great and people will hear them. And uh, But of course, after Tom died, uh, after the dust settles, there is a bit of like, well, I love doing this and we all do. And we want it to continue and Tom would want it to continue. Yeah, of course. Um, but then there's the matter of, you know... Can we do Tom's Legacy justice? And you don't want to, you don't want to just fizzle out and do something rubbish or substandard. You know, it's got to be it's that's, such that's crazy not... context. It's yeah. it's an unusual situation. Yeah. Where you know Kirk Kirk Bain didn't die and Nirvana carry on. Mm. Of course, you know that would be like losing Sam as well, in a sense, because there's still a lot of character that the rest of the band carries but obviously Tom's part of the band is he's at the core of it you know yeah um and I said you know after Tom died publicly that you know I don't want to pretend that Tom wasn't vital I don't want to I don't want to play down his role to make it seem like we have a better shot of carrying on or anything like that you know because that's disrespectful yeah um but I was anxious to know whether we could carry on because I want to, you know, yeah. because it's it's a really good job. <laughs> um, and and we, I was talking earlier about changing trauma into great art. Yeah, I've got trauma in bucket loads. I was going to say. <laughs> You've um, got the opportunity, but uh, without meaning to sound glib, but you've got it's it's going to be the most apparent way that you can all, as a group of friends, work through something. Sure, yeah, absolutely. And learning guitar, and you know, I, I, I've been uh, my role with Tom in terms of writing really especially on the last two albums and really especially on all our gods was tom would write something might be a riff or two riffs and then we would sit down together and think about where it's going to go mm. and i would turn it into a song you know structure it tell him what i don't think works and tell him that that actually that bit sounds like a verse not a chorus or whatever you know yeah. the sort of producer's role in a sense arrangement stuff <laughs> it's, it's difficult for me to talk about because I don't want to like big myself up like oh actually I'm more important to architects than everyone thinks what I want what I yeah, want but to I don't I don't think anyone well I don't think anyone's going to sit there and think that that's what you're doing and I don't think anyone would would probably undersell your part within the band any more than you would do you know what I mean sure, yeah, I think yeah. I think that's I think that is that is something that a lot of people are very guilty of in a sense that a lot of musicians will always downplay what what they do but um, yeah I don't think anyone's yeah. gonna go look at this guy now all <laughs> yeah, of a sudden. yeah 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 turns out he was the brains yeah no and I and I, I don't want to pretend that is the case but um I also did play a, a sizable role in in the writing of the songs, yeah. um, and that role has had to be increased. But that's really helped me, you know. Yeah. Create all, always any kind of creative expression is is good in these kind of instances, you know, and. Um, Again, I just wanted to like dive into it, and you know that's why like, a week after Tom died, I didn't know what to do. So I went and got that guitar right there, and was like, "All right, I'm going to play guitar. I'm going to. I'm not going to be architect's guitarist, but mm. I want to. I want. You know, I'm going to learn guitar. I'm going to play guitar because why not? You know. Yeah. And that's not to say that I'm going to write loads of 
big riffs on their next album and they're going to sound like like they'd be like the most basic riffs you've ever heard which unfortunately is not what we do um but it's been a whole new experience for me in terms of being creative and what that does for me and the sort of I I don't want I want to say like the more sort of I want to say mystical side of that process yeah that's been a whole that's been a massive learning curve for me um and I've I've never I've never been the sort of the origin of creation before. I've sort of worked with something that's been created, hmm. and so now I I've have a chance to be the origin. Not entirely, I'm, you know. Other guys are a part of it, um, but that's interesting. And and the way things come to you. And uh, when I write something and it sounds like Tom wrote it. Um, that's a really interesting thing for me. Yeah. Where I'll write it and then listen back and think, this sounds exactly like Tom would have wrote it. This sounds, you know, Tom always wrote something and sent me, which one riff sent me in my email, mm. you know, and I know that this, the, it, I'm not doing it purposefully. You know, it's just yeah. that we have, we were in, me, we were very different people in many ways, but very similar in lots of ways as well, especially our tastes. Yeah. We're very similar. And I think, you know, this is an interesting thing. This is a whole other world to to talk about because, I, for a start, I I you know I played in a band which had twins in it mm. for a long time, and I oh of course yeah so, yeah sorry no, but I would uh, the Perry's yeah yeah so I would see um it's like I drummer would, and singer yeah yeah. But I would still see the connection between the two, maybe not on a in a musical sense, mm. but I would see how they both were, mm. you know, stupid stuff like getting up in the morning and wearing the same clothes, <laughs> right? Which sounds which sounds like a ludicrous like twin yeah. like cliche. Yeah, me and Tom but, avoided that. <laughs> yeah, good, but. But what I'm saying is, I would see, I see, I would see that connection. Yeah. There would be certain things, like one of them would say something to me if we were in rehearsal, and then would leave the room, and then the other one would turn up and say the exact same thing, <laughs> word for word. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's something I think is is really interesting. It is, and and um, <laughs> and also, mis- I think maybe this is a conversation like there's certain things that I'm curious just mm. that I just want to ask you but I don't know that it's now this, that, like it, this is the situation well that's your your call yeah I I'm open you know I know but I, I think it's interesting one of the things that made me laugh at the this sounds, that sounds like a terrible thing to start a sentence with one of the things that made me laugh at the wake was when you were saying about shopping for a crack pipe to smoke DMT. Yeah, it's up there. What the pipe? Yeah. yeah. Um, which, which was it was you know hilarious the way you said it and you said sorry to one of your aunts I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah. But it did it. It made me think about that and how um, DMT is viewed by can be viewed by people as being a um almost like a a, a way to enter into other Mm. uh, other states of mind or other realms of consciousness Mm -hmm. right yeah which throws open a whole interesting conversation about that because i know that that was something that that all of you guys in the band are into or interested in right everyone except sam yeah except sam yeah ah interesting Sam's not a hallucinogenic fan. He has done them. We peer pressured him into mushrooms on Warp Tour. <laughs> peer pressure. Okay. Well, that's a whole because different story. I had, yeah, because I had a conversation with him about that, about DMT. And he was saying that um, that there'd been, I don't know, he, he said to me that there'd been talk about um, 
smoking some at a particular time and in a particular place. Yeah, haven't done it. Good, because I don't think that's the ideal set and setting. To, sure. To, yeah, to, to, and, and to venture disclaim, into I haven't smoked it. Yeah, at all. I haven't smoked any yet. You know, um, and it's. <laughs> I don't have any. Uh, yeah. I've got a substitute, but I've, I've just yeah. been. I want that's something I want to do, uh, and I want it to be the just the like time. I've been in a strange place, you know. No shit. Um, and I've had friends who are experienced with those kind of things say maybe just wait a moment. Yeah, um, that's what I think as well. Not that I'm experiencing. Tom those said. Things. Tom bought it as a gift for me from him. Ultimately, now, but he said to me, "We, were, me and him, were got picked up in an ambulance in Luxembourg from the bus to go to the hospital, and we were riding in the back of the ambulance, sirens and everything." And Tom said to me, "The next, yeah, so when he woke up from the coma, he said to me, all I was thinking about in the ambulance was fuck." I never got around to smoking that DMT. But yeah, that is something that um, fascinates me. And, and yeah, me and Tom love doing magic mushrooms together. We did them lots of times together. It shapes to who we are in many ways, you know. Yeah. It does change you, you know. Oh, 100%. In a good way. Yeah. I think things which may be... Um, ways of altering consciousness or accessing other states of consciousness and places that that are spoken of in a mystical manner probably yeah is best waited on a little while but mm. also I'm I'm optimistic I understand yeah, yeah. you know what I mean mm. because, and I am too yeah I think it's it's such a weird one and it's almost like I don't want to be like I can't even say it do you are, are you an optimistic person now in in within with regard to well as you said earlier you know the the physicality of of who we are isn't you know there, there's a little more going on than that or we'd yeah. like to think right yeah I think it's highly likely in my view yeah <laughs> yeah i do, do you how so just through optimism or through through the through meditation and whatnot or i don't know it's not even a question I'm just, <laughs> this is, oh, I'm, we're just kind of i i feel i said earlier i f sort of feel like i can achieve anything i put my mind to hmm. I still believe that, even though I thought that would work with Tom. I think that's a different case. I feel very... Um, I, I feel know. like we're skirting around things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Maybe we, we should are. probably turn yeah. this off and have a conversation. But yeah, I, I look, I'm, I feel... Let's sort of put it to more basic terms. I feel very good about the future. I feel inspired inspired and I feel strongly that I want to do Tom's legacy proud and that means a lot to me mm. um, I feel good about who I am um, and here's something that's odd as well I feel more like Tom than I ever have done before in my life that's interesting and I had felt that sensation, that feeling, I would say things sometimes or think things or feel things. I think that's that's what Tom was like, you know. And mm. and then following that, I had two or three people in quick succession tell me there's more of Tom in you now than there ever was before. And it's a beautiful thing. But it, I, that could be... That's you could have all sorts of thoughts on that, on yeah. why that is. Yeah. But um, I fear it's very, very noticeable, and the more I notice it, the, the more think it comes through. Tricking myself, you know, being I, devil's advocate. 
I don't think I no I I'm uh, I'm all for who know gung you know, ho who, let's head towards <laughs> the mystical sure yeah and I suppose it doesn't matter either way but yeah I feel really yeah it's a it's a strange phenomena and I you know, can't explain it and I have all you know I. I you know, I've listened to your podcast, Dan, and I and I know that um, I can hear the apprehension in your voice sometimes when it you start edging into <laughs> mystical subjects. <laughs> well, like that's my thing. That's my whole agenda. Is like, how am I going to shoot well, all like, this in? Does this person think feel- I'm crazy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. And yeah. I, I'm pretty sure uh, we share common ground. I know we do because we've spoken before about mm. this kind of thing. Um, and then it comes to the point where you're doing something like this and you think, Actually, ah, I don't know but it's I'm... more than just the two people here that are going to think. Yeah. Um, sometimes I think about Tom very intently when I'm meditating. Hmm. And it physically if, it has a bizarre phys- physical effect on me. Like... If I get deep enough, my entire all the hairs on my body stand on end. What do you think that means? I find it comforting. I'll say that. Perfect. But yeah, who really knows? But I, 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 uh, I think about Tom when we're writing. You know. When we're writing music, what would Tom do? What would Tom think? Would Tom think that this is shit? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Tom could be self-deprecating. Yeah. Um, and I found actually that Tom became... The, the the less self-deprecating Tom was, the better the music got, actually. Yeah. And there's a balance, isn't it? You don't want to be overconfident and cocky and think you're the best. But um, yeah. Shouldn't you also don't want to put yourself down. you don't want to start believing it. Because Tom, Tom said that Match Made in Heaven deserved to win a Grammy. And, you know, I think he thought, you know, well, if I die, then I'll probably get a Grammy. <laughs> but I, I've, I'm excited that, we're, that there will be more music. I don't know when. I don't know when we're going to release anything. Um, do you know what you're going to, in what format you do it? Would it be straight in with an album? I don't know yet. I really don't know yet. And, and I don't want to... I don't really want to speculate too much but I just it's better just to let those things happen and see where you end up exactly and it's uh, it's going to be it's hard not to, I try not to think about what people will think you know David Bowie says don't play to the gallery don't do don't worry about your audience yeah and when I'm writing I don't when I'm not writing, when I'm walking down the street, sometimes I think, oh, what do people, what are people going to make of it? You know, because, like I said, I spoke with Tom all the time about the next album. I yeah. know exactly what we want. I we have we know what we want to do. Yeah, I know what Tom wanted to do, and I intend to honour that and respect that. Is um, it going to sound like Tool? <laughs> Shh. Um, but I I don't want to. I don't want to think too much about because you know if 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 we release something radically different hypothetically, hmm. then people might think, oh well, that's because Tom didn't write it. Um, if we write something exactly the same, well, I don't people want to go. Oh, they're trying to sound. Yeah, we're trying to rip off Tom's riffs, or but you can't. You can't, you can't win. No, <laughs> you can't win. It is actually. Which, which it is, what is what actually. Yeah. So I we we'll just do. We'll just do what we do, and and you know it it's so important to me that the quality is there and so however much time that takes um it doesn't matter you know yeah. i don't think do you think you're going to be even more critical though when you're writing i think you will personally yeah and do you know what like tom was and it wasn't like you weren't before no and tom was tom was brutal um mm. i would say he was too hard on himself um and set standards that were unattainable for himself. Mm. Um, and that made him unhappy sometimes. 
because of course it did yeah um i am you know like tom put sam through the there you go i can imagine goodness <laughs> like i don't think sam would mind me saying like uh, uh, sam worked so hard on all our gods that at one point sam just broke down in tears mm. um because he was just emotionally fraught you know you, and screaming like that for hours on end day after yeah. day after day you know it's just not normal but you know more often than not you know it was Tom saying and again not necessarily you know the, the guys that we recorded the last few records with could, could be tough but Tom was the real he was the one holding the whip really and oh, well now or maybe I have to do that I don't know we'll, we'll, you know I think it's important for all of us to push each other but uh, it was easy for me to stand and let Tom do the pushing do the pushing yeah sometimes um, but yeah. I know that all the guys of course I'm not that that makes it sound like the other guys are, are sort of have low standards which is not the case you no know? of course but not but you need you, you need someone you do need someone to yeah. to play that role and it is a tough role to play because you you have to know when when it's right to push and when when you you're just being a dick yeah yeah exactly yeah yeah and it's, and that's you know that is a fine balance to walk yeah, absolutely um, but I find it interesting that you're saying that people are commenting about how they see so much of him in you mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. but then maybe that will be the the means for that to happen perhaps you will be that whip hand yeah perhaps I will um, and I just hope that mm. everyone else in my band understands <laughs> <laughs> um, but everyone you know like everyone is it's not all just about me you know like no, well, I'm talking not. a lot from my Point that's of view. That's because you and I sat here talking. Yeah, but you know the other guys. It's it's harsh. It's it's a very very heavy situation for everyone, and you know, they yeah. they were all deeply entrenched in everything that unfolded. I don't think anyone's going to judge you and be like, oh, it's just <laughs> it's all about Dan, isn't it? <laughs> I know. I you know, it's, it going on tour after it happened was just for Sam. I just felt. Sam having to speak about it publicly night after night yeah. and and sing those words and sing those words and there have been a few nights uh, well, like it, uh, in London and I spoke uh, actually when we were in Russia as well um, before we played Gone With The Wind just I felt like it was necessary on those occasions and it's really not easy and mm. um, yeah I yeah, I commend Sam for having gotten through all those nights doing that because it's hard and the strangest thing is for me playing live is that everyone probably thinks that I sit there the whole set feeling sad thinking I wish Tom was here and why not that Tom's not stood there but it mostly doesn't occur to me Yeah. for whatever reason I just play and that's I don't that's... think about him being absent it's only when Sam mentions about Tom right, right. at the end of the set that I go fuck yeah it hits me yeah and it doesn't always it doesn't always hit me some nights I'm just like okay you know let's play the song you know and then some nights it's like hits me right in the in the chest you know it's a strange thing but um it's a public it's very public grieving you know going on yeah. tour like that um and people knowing what you've been through as you know everyone I felt like people gravitate towards me a little bit which I understand um, but do you, that must be overwhelming because they must want to sure I don't because, want to talk about it all the time yeah of course and and I think the thing is when, once somebody is, is so in love with a band that they, they and they invest all their emotions in it because it, it speaks to them mm. they're going to want to come up to you and, and project that at you yeah and I and can't deal with it. I can't like, imagine. And, you know, I've had people come up to me in tears, of course, you know, and, and mm. sometimes maybe I seem cold, I don't know, but I just, you know, I can't. Sometimes I'm, I'm, I've am i just gotten out of the dressing room having a beer with my mates, having a laugh, yeah. you know, and then to walk straight out to, like, 
to the bus and someone's talked to me and they're really upset I can't always sort of engage in that because it's, it's I can't constantly turn that on and off and sometimes once I've turned it off I have turned it off quite pretty hard to make sure I you know yeah. I don't have to deal with that for the rest of the day because I can't carry it with me all the time of course not and I think most people are going to be able to understand that not everyone I, because yeah. pe- people get lost in themselves don't they when they're um, it's, you know fans at gigs can be a little have sure. have like the, the blinkers on and they, they're just I need to do this and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and or they want to meet this person even if it's just to get something signed I've got to meet them you know it's, yeah. like, an, it's like an imperative that it happens so I can only imagine how that would then be in the situation you're in yeah. So, um, yeah, it's a tough one. And I, I think the, the flip side of that is it, it brings us back around to why I'm sat here talking to you now in the same sense to a certain degree that, that everyone is going to want to talk yeah. to you about it. And, and yeah, I, there, I, there are things that, you know, I've spoken about that I, I, you know, I think it was important for people to know, mm. you know. I, if for some reason it felt important for me to for people not to paint this super bleak image of everything that happened mm. so yeah it was really fucking hard and it was horrible a lot of it but we had great times amongst it and Tom was great we were sat smoking weed blasting Colos by Meshuggah in the hospice with the doors open you know like it having fun yeah which just sounds absurd under the circumstances I don't think so I think it's beautiful <laughs> but it was it was just like well what else are we going to do and that's what Tom wanted to do you know mm. um, so yeah I think that's important to me that people know I guess how well Dot Tom dealt with it but you know we'll say that there can be beautiful moments amongst really challenging times you know and I hope that we can can continue that trend you know even now when things are so still difficult um you know you've seen while i've been talking to you it's not easy for me to speak about a lot of it um and it's it's not kind of thing you ever get over i suppose but the emotions aren't that dulled Hmm. Uh, it's only been six months but i still feel strongly that we can create something amazing out of this situation and, and carry the band forward. I think and you already have, though. Yeah. 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 And and I think that those those next steps, which which you would almost say are the logical steps, but they're not really, because it's, it's not a, a sort of straightforward logical situation, but the next steps I'm really looking forward to. And I am too. And it's unique. And I, when something like this happens, you look for all oh, comparisons. Humans love to do it, don't they? Yeah. Really try and relate to someone, to something. Yeah. And you know, so I look at Vinnie Paul losing his brother. Yeah. And then I think about like suicide silence, m- losing Mitch. Um, plenty of bands have lost people. And, but they're not you. But it's not me, and yeah. it's it's so unique that it's so unique that we were able, that we lost Tom and were able to even go go and play one show in a, in a in a way, you know, and and then to carry on beyond that, you know, mm. losing uh, you know the the main songwriter of the band. That's it's a risk, but it's just an unusual and rare situation, um, and I almost. I, sometimes I feel as though my presence in the band almost gives it the the, the go ahead in a sense. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. you wouldn't want to just be carrying the carcass of a band that's done to make yeah. some money or whatever yeah. it is, you know. Yeah. But w- I'm able to authentically say that yeah we we can carry on we should carry on I know we should carry on I know Tom wants us to carry on I know we can and and again it comes back to my belief in belief you know I believe very strongly that we'll carry on I believe very strongly that we will continue to make 
good music and carry the band forward and that is I'm trying not to obsess over that um, yeah I think that I think, <laughs> I think you will <laughs> yeah it's important to me because I know it's it's yeah. a representation of Tom and you know there's there, no matter what we do there's to, there, there's Tom in there I mean quite literally two of the songs you know were mm. Tom wrote but um, uh, Tom will always written be a part fin- of it were those written and finished yeah yeah um, and there were a few other things that we had worked on that were unfinished um, are you going to carry on with those do you think yeah I finished th- I finished one of them yeah we we wrote started writing a third song and I messed around with it for ages because it felt so important that it had to be right yeah. because it was like literally taking the bones of a song um, and completing it like I would have done with Tom um, but it was st- one of those ones you know I don't have Tom's approval uh so I just it really strained over it, but um, yeah, I'm I'm very very happy with it. Uh, but it's a long way before, sadly, um, most people will hear it. But um, I'm excited that that there will be uh, a chance for at some point for people to hear that stuff, and I'm excited that that Tom is a part of it, and Josh is a part of it, and all the guys are a part of it now. You know, so yeah. um, and I think there will be more collaboration between the, the whole band as well which is a nice thing for everyone I think yeah because I think it'll be a, an amazing way for everyone to come pull pull even closer and, yeah and 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 it will resonate forward. it yeah. will resonate with you know you don't have to be a genius to work out what the album will be about you know yeah Thank you for listening to episode number 18 of Someone Who Isn't Me with Dan from Architects. That was a very different episode, and yet I really enjoyed hanging out with him, regardless of of what the conversation was about, which was really heavy. And I know that sounds kind of a weird thing to say, but he's he's an amazing person and a good dude. So, yeah. So he can be found on Twitter and Instagram, at Dan Architects. I'm at Daniel P. Carter. If you go to iTunes, you could leave a nice five-star rating and a review or comment or something, that would be wicked. Also, as I said at the start, I know that a lot of this is probably going to get used on some new sites or in print perhaps, which is fine because that's essentially why Dan contacted me in the first place to do this. So yeah, please try and keep things in context. Also, please don't turn any of this into clickbait because